Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome. My name is Paige Berger, and I'm the marketing director here at Barrett Bookstore. And on, the, on behalf of the entire staff, I'm pleased to welcome you to this event this evening. I'm joined by my colleague, Rosanna Nissen, who is manning the chat and the tech side of things, and our distinguished guests, Mishama Bailey and Jonna Morisano, who I will introduce in a moment. We have such a lovely crowd gathered here this evening. For those of you who aren't familiar with Barrett Bookstore, because we know we have people joining from all over the country, we are in our 81st year of business, and we're so grateful for the community's support to help ensure that we stick around for many years to come. Tonight, we are here to celebrate the release of this, the best book, and I, I, I don't say that, many of you have joined us for many events. This is the best book I've read in 2021, celebrate the release of Black, White, and the Gray. And before I talk a little bit more about Mishama and Jono, I do wanna thank all of our event partners who joined us to bring you this event this evening. Everyone I'm about to mention is either a small business or um, an organization that's giving support to a small business. And we're so grateful they're all here with us tonight. So thank you to Lorca Coffee Bar, Avellino Family Barbecue, CT Bites, Hay Stanford, Flower Water Salt Bread, Chef Dory Greenspan, Sipsters, Darian Library, Neat Coffee, the Women's Business Development Council, Mama Collective, Rise Donuts, Baywater Properties, PG Properties, and the Corbin District. It's really a pleasure to partner with you all tonight. For those of you who haven't used Crowdcast before, this is a webinar platform. So no one can see you. Feel free to pour yourself a drink and put your feet up. There is a lovely chat on the right side of your screen. If you wanna say something now, nice or give a shout out, feel free to pop it in there. We are also gonna have time for questions towards the end of the program. So if there's a question that you would like me to ask uh, Chef or Jono, you can pop it in the bottom of your screen where it says, ask a question. Finally, if you have not yet, purchase your copy of Black, White, and the Gray, there is a button at the bottom of the screen that will take you directly to our website and you can purchase it there. We ship all over the United States. You can pick it up in the store. We have plenty of copies and we're looking forward to discussing the book with you. Now, on to our guests. We're really honored tonight to be joined by Chef Mashama Bailey, born in the Bronx and raised in Queens. I'm gonna let her shed a little light on her roots in New York City and Savannah, but suffice it to say in her position as executive chef of the Gray was something of a homecoming for her. Immediately prior to being a partner at the Gray, Mashama was a chef at Prune on Manhattan's Lower East Side under the tutelage of her friend and mentor, Gabrielle Hamilton. As the executive chef of the Gray, Mashama has earned a number of accolades, including James Beard Foundation's Best Chef Southeast Award in 2019, she also serves as vice chairman on the board of the Edna Lewis Foundation, working to preserve and celebrate Edna's legacy that heavily influences her menu at the grain. Jono Morisano, her partner, is the product of a tight-knit Italian family, born and raised in New York City. He worked in the world of media startups for most of his career, which gave him the opportunity to travel extensively and develop his love for food and wine. After buying a home in Savannah in 2011, Jono started investing in the community he has come to love. The Gray, which was named Eater's Best Restaurant of the Year for 27, 20, 2017, 18, is the result of his passions for building businesses, food, wine, people, and energy all coming together under one roof. Jono is also, among other community pursuits, the treasurer of the Edna Lewis Foundation. And with that, I am going to welcome Jono. Oops, I got We got to get. We got to get equal here. There we go. And hi. unmute them. Jono Lashama. Hi. Thank you so much hi. for being here. Um, gosh, when you all hear what Jono and Mashama are up to tonight, they are literally in the middle of service in New York City. Uh huh. At the intersect by Lexus, which I'm going to ask them about so they can tell you about it. Um, but it's really an honor and thank you for carving out the time. This is no, quite an I'm unusual happy. picture. I'm happy say. to be here. Yeah, this is great. I'm so happy because I'm sitting and I have a glass of wine. So I feel good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I'm, I'm conscious that um, before we dive into the book, we are at the year anniversary when 
the world went a bit sideways. Um, we've been living with COVID now um, in terms of the national psyche since last March. And I just want to ask you guys, how are you doing? Um, hills and valleys. <laughs> Hills and valleys. I did like literally. I was crying for the last four days, and I think I think so that we're, um, in, we're in a prep kitchen, and that's the ice machine. So every like twenty minutes or so, you'll hear a block of ice drop. So yeah, you hear water run. So we're not in the bathroom, and no one's peeing in the corner. It's just the ice machine, and it needs. The, I don't know what ice machines do, but they run water. So it is what it is. Um. So. It's just it's, sometimes, you know, you can kind of focus on the task at hand. And then other times you think about the world as a, as, a, as a planet and you start to kind of reflect on what you want in your future. And I think it's really kind of it's a hard time, but it's also like this time where a lot of people or a lot of us are reflecting about our future and wanting to understand, like, how are we going to what are we going to be doing in five years and what's going to be in the future in the next six months? So it's hopeful time because people are getting vaccinated and we're moving forward, but it's hard to hire cooks in these days because they all want to be writers and interior designers or farmers. It's like, uh, yeah, this moment of clarity, but um, it's good though. Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, the business, it's you know it's hard it's like you go from having a thriving business to literally no revenue at all if you're closed you know a lot of businesses everybody had it hard but you know anybody in fmb or hospitality shut down so my low point was last summer i think and i've been sort of digging myself out of that depressed hole that i think that universally a lot of us went through and i do feel hopeful now you know vaccines are great and seeing regulars come back into the dining room you know who you haven't seen in a year and they show up and i'm like you're vaccinated aren't you and they're like hmm? you know and then it's like you get a hug and we haven't had a hug in a year there's a real estate agent in savannah she's pretty notorious like you get off the plane and there's an ad right in the airport um, and I'm going to give her a shameless plug. Her name is Celia Dunn. And she um, came to the restaurant on Friday night. And I hadn't seen her in over a year. And she walked, she's about 10 feet away from me. And she literally walks to me with her arms wide open the entire way. She was just so happy to be out, so happy to see us. And that's the part that you warm, that warms your heart and reconnects you to what you're doing. So. It's 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 hills and valleys. Yeah. <laughs> hills and valleys. I think that's the perfect way to describe it. Um, I'm going to start it. I'm going to start at the beginning a little bit for those of um, those in the audience who may not be familiar with the gray and sort of how you've ended up now running Intersect in New York City and all the other adventures you're on. So, Jono, your background is an entrepreneur, and um, at some point in your journey, you decide it's a great idea to buy um, a, a Greyhound bus terminal in Savannah. That's you just you go ahead and do that. And um, can you walk us through sort of how you arrived at that moment and when that purchase was made? Did you know you were? sort of taking a left turn and heading into the restaurant industry or did you have other visions for what was happening at that point in your career? Um, so I was at a really, <laughs> I was at a low point in my career, frankly, like I had split up with my business partner, a longstanding business partner. And I was in New York city primarily. And I just, and as that breakup, as part of that breakup, like we, we had to, separate and get rid of everything and so i was confronted with this idea of starting over at like 44 45 years old and i didn't want to i was just really burned out and i was working on this not-for-profit project and that was ruling um and so carol and i had purchased this house down in savannah as part of our retirement plan like it was we were we were investing in it in hope that it would increase in value and we can retire partially down there over like the next 10 or 15 years and 
when I sort of concluded that I didn't, I couldn't bear, frankly, to start over in New York City. And so I said to my wife, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go use that house we have down in Savannah, and I'm going to look around that town for opportunity. And the idea of be being a landlord seemed appealing for a very brief period of time, like buy a building, renovate it, you know, and then rent it. But as soon as I saw the bus terminal, it was such a special building. And I always had this secret desire to be involved in a restaurant because I really had become passionate about food and wine over my adult life. And I thought about a couple of like passive investments in New York City. And I was like, that, thank God I didn't do that because, you know, restaurants lose more often than they win. Um, but as soon as I, as soon as we closed on the building, I went home that night and told my wife that we were going to build a restaurant in that space. And she's like, oh, you have gone crazy. You know, you've done some crazy stuff, but that's really crazy. And that was it. And so subconsciously, I think, yes, I was always intending on building a restaurant. Um, I, I heard you, I heard an interview with you um, a bit back and you called yourself uh, a restaurant rat. Like some people are gym yeah. rats. You're a restaurant rat. I love, I love that term. Yeah, I am a restaurant, definitely. I love them, love them. I love being in them. Okay, so fast forward a little bit. You buy you buy this terminal, and you decide maybe you're gonna maybe you're gonna open a restaurant. And Mishama, during this time, you are arguably pretty much rocking and rolling. You're working at Prune, which a lot of people in this area are very familiar with. It's Gabrielle Hamilton's beautiful little restaurant that we hope comes back after the pandemic. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> Please. Um, yeah, we're all hoping for that. Sending lots of good vibes into the universe. And so you're you're rocking it there. You're sous chef. You've got pre a pretty stable position. Before Jono comes into the picture, and I'm going to get to that. What was your vision at that point for where you wanted to go in your career? I wanted to own my own business. So. I have been. I would work. I was working for Gabrielle for two and a half years, and she had another opportunity to kind of move me over to another space that was on the same street, and um, that opportunity fell through. And so I kind of like reverted back, and there was a promotion, and um, with a sous chef alongside of me, and I call her my nemesis. But it's not a real thing. It's just really in my head. But I literally introduced her as my nemesis. And so she took she took a leap over me and became the CDC at Prune. And I was ready to kind of leave. And I was like, you know what? I'm done here. I think I'm ready to go. And I reconnected with some of the line cooks there. And I realized that it was important for me to stay and kind of see this through and and help. I don't know. I just felt like I wasn't ready, even though I, my ego wanted me to go because I felt like I was passed up for a position. So I stayed and I started working. I continued to work in the kitchen and all that stuff. And then um, during that time, I was like, okay, I'm not gonna be a lead person here. What's the next step? And I started thinking about how I could apply my skills, my resources to my own space. And I was living in Queens at the time and I was sort of being not really a primary caregiver to my grandmother, but I was sort of like a stable person in the house. You can't really be a primary caregiver when you're a sous chef at any restaurant. You're just like sleeping there, waking up there, going to work. But I was there on my days off and I kind of took care of some things with her that was necessary. And so I was sort of like, all right, I can do, I, I can move from Manhattan into Queens and I can start my own business and I can start my own restaurant. And that was kind of the trajectory that I was taking when um, I had realized that Prune, I had hit a ceiling and I knew that if I left, I was going to go back into sort of like this white coat, like I'm wearing now, um, brigade sort of kitchen, because that was what was attractive to me at the time. And um, I didn't want to do that. I don't want to work for a bunch of white guys. So I just was like, all right, I'm going to open. Sorry, Jono. <laughs> I don't really technically work for him. Right, that's true. <laughs> that's it, yeah. um, but I didn't want to do that. You know, I was yeah. just like, I don't want to, I don't want to be in a bunch of kitchen with a bunch of 
dudes that are really frankly just neither do I ego driven. I was like, I just want of my own thing. And I started doing pop-ups and I started doing them at my grandmother's house. And so enter John O. Morrison. Okay, so Jono Jono enters the picture and you know he he pitches this idea to you over a series. I should say, I'm not gonna go into detail because again, you guys, this book. Yeah. You can you can read it, read it there. I'm not gonna give it all away. But through a series of meetings and events, you know, he shares this idea he has with you. And you know, like a smart, strong, rational woman, I'm sure in your head you're thinking, A sounds a bit crazy. I don't know. You're good to be true. So walk me through pros and cons. Do you make a list? Like what's in the pro category of this and what scares the hell out of you from, yeah. you know, an entrepreneurial? That's such a great question. <laughs> so the pros was that I was going to relocate to the South. The pros, even though I did not possess or own this title, that I was a partner. And then I think another pro was that I was going to be a chef. So those threes were, and it was all about me. I had nothing to do with them. It was like, huh, this is a great opportunity and this is what I can get from it. And I can be closer to my family. That was, that was that my was parents. It was a big one for me. My parents were living maybe 90 miles away from Savannah. They still do. They live 90 miles away. So a huge part of it was that my parents were close by and my mother's family was very close by. So that was really kind of the reason, the catalyst for me to really kind of jump in feet first. The cons, I didn't know him from a hole in a ball at all. Yeah. Um, that I was going to leave New York City to be a chef and I didn't know if that was going to be worth my um, time or if it was gonna derail me in some way. Yeah. And that I had to trust, that I had to trust the process of it all. That was a little bit of a con because I felt like I was able to predict what I was gonna do here and going in another state, I wasn't able to predict that. I didn't know clientele, I didn't know any purveyors. I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to, I, I knew how to write a schedule and I knew how to order food. And that was like probably the two things that I felt comfortable in. I didn't really know how to write a menu yet. And I was totally full of shit. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know how to do yeah, profit loss. Yeah, food costs, totally. I'm just, I, got, I got you. And I was like, okay. I'm like, all right. I didn't believe See you then. See you in a few months. <laughs> okay, so you don't know this guy at all he shows up he makes you this you know offer i mean Jono, to your you know you've got gabrielle i guess telling you that she's she's a gem that you're gonna want to you know sweep up and and take with you down to savannah but how how did you end up building trust i mean is this something that what is it a slow drip over time i mean you guys entered yes. a two, you know like a serious partnership um yeah. without knowing each other and i and i am not an entrepreneurial expert but my sense is from friends i know and, and who are entrepreneurs a lot of that comes from existing relationships you right. know a lot of those partnerships are between and that's not, not always well advised it's just the way it is so um talk me through a little bit about how you developed that trust um well it's funny when you say Gabrielle, you know, said you have this gem on your hand because she was actually, when we met, she was, she's like, you know, I think if you're not crazy and I want to think about that, I want to, you, maybe you should meet my sous chef, Mishama Bali. But she didn't oversell Mishama at all or really even sell her. She just basically said you should meet her, you know. Um, I thought she said I was the best cook she's ever met. She did say that. <laughs> She did say that. She did say that. That's true. But that, no, but I, so the, the anecdote that I'm, I want to tell is like after we were going through all of it and Misham and I were like, had decided that we were at least going to seriously explore this relationship. I remember I was at a dog park on like Second Avenue and 16th Street with my dog and I was on the phone with Gabrielle and I'm like, you know, I never really asked you, like, is she a good cook? 
And Gabrielle was like, are you kidding me? Do you think I would introduce you to someone who can't cook? I'm like, okay, I'm really, really sorry. She's like, of course she's a good cook. And she may have dropped an F-bomb or two in that conversation. Um, but the trust thing has just been, it's been going on for seven and a half years now. I mean, you know, I think that, frankly, the book was a big part of us overcoming a lot of the unspoken things that we hadn't talked about. You know, we learned how to work together and we learned how to be friends together. And we learned, I learned how to give Mishama space. I'm not always great at that. You know, she learned that I'm always going to throw out a dumb idea, you know, and that you just got to kind of sift through them for the one good one that made. And so we learned all that stuff, but the trust, the book writing was a big thing to be bring the relationship to a new level and time and honesty. Donna loves pressure. He loves it. I don't know if I love it. He loves it. He loves I think it. I thrive on it. He loves it. Yeah. And um, the funny part is that for the first two, three years, neither of us knew what we were doing. So I think we spent a lot of time sort of like hiding from the other how much we didn't know. So I always had a feeling like I never thought like I was going to have like this whole holistic black brand restaurant group, right? Or, you know, or borrowing money from a black bank and like 100% black, black, black. Because when you look at the fine dining environment, you don't see a lot of folks that look like me, especially ones in, in power. And when I talk about power, I'm talking about investors and I'm talking about money. So I always knew that I was going to partner with a multiracial group of people, whatever that was going to be. So that was never really a surprise for me. And I think that we were, our heads were down and I accepted that he was Jono in front of house or all the part, because he was still learning and I think he was still trying to figure out what his contribution was going to be because he wanted to be more than just an angel investor. He wanted to be engaged and involved in the restaurant and the everyday inner workings of it, right? And, yeah. and I knew that I was gonna be doing the food. So I think like once we kind of got comfortable in those roles is when we started to learn more about each other's personality and we had to understand like what the other one was bringing to the table and if we were being critical of each other unfairly. And I think that that was sort of like the catalyst of what the book, you know, because you start to make these predetermined associations with people because of where they came from and because of the color of their skin. And we never really thought about that in the beginning because we were both in the weeds. We were both kind of full of it. And we were like, all right, we're going to try to figure this out. We're going to do the job and we're going to try to get people in the building. And once that, once the smoke of that kind of cleared, we were left with each other. And it's like, do we really understand each other? Do we really understand where the other one's coming from? And so I think that had a lot to do with um, why we kind of were so honest in this book because it helped our relationship grow. There's a there's a chapter where Michelle, I think it, you were. It was maybe your birthday. This was getting close to where you you, you know you were getting ready to open, and Jono calls you, and it's you know 8 a.m. Which anyone who's ever worked in the restaurant industry, you know, if you've been working till late, it's, you know, it's too early. It's not a thing. It's yeah. And I have to say, the brilliance with which you guys depicted that whole scene you know he clearly he wanted he had a vision of what he needed from you and you you because you just said you know he's always wants to you know pressure and get it done and you didn't say it in so many words but you could feel it i could sort of i was almost shrinking back like reading the book like just let me do it my way and that's i think one of the first places in the book where Jono, you said something to the effect of you could you know the frustration was clear and it was the first time it entered your mind, am I frustrated because she's black? Is this a race thing? Like, oh my gosh. And Mishama, you know, subsequently you start to have, you know, some questioning of biases that let's be clear, if you've grown up in America, <laughs> I don't care what the color of is, yeah. you know, 
we have a promise of many beautiful things in this country, but in order to get there, we've got to unpack and unlearn and, and work hard to, to get there. So anyway, I guess what I'm trying to understand and maybe for all the entrepreneurs and people who have partners um, in the audience. So you guys wrote the book and, and at that point you were really forced to reckon but did yeah. you have conversations along the way or, or was it really the book that made you sit down and say, okay, we got to talk about some of these things? Yeah. One of, I'm, I'm going to let John talk about this, but one of the things that I said when we did our final edit was that he wrote a book that our relationship wasn't ready for. It was, we never talked about these things. So when I read that scene, I and I tend to clam up when I feel um, put upon. And I feel like when I'm uncomfortable, I tend to sort of quiet and withdraw. And so like, I'm sort of really related to the fact that you sort of like ease back because I'm a little bit like a turtle, right? Like I'm like, Ugh, I don't like this. This makes me feel uncomfortable. Let me go in my shell. And then you can say what you have to say. And then I'll come out once all the bombs are dropped and try to give you this evaluation of what I think. And so... It took a, a lot of rewrites for me to get as close as I have gotten in that chapter to talk about how I really felt because it didn't make a lot of sense to me. It didn't seem like a big ask. It just seemed like, you know, I was here in this foreign place and I needed space and this is how I needed to unleash some pressure because I felt like I was really engaged for months and then I was like, all right, this is great. And I'm learning, but I just kind of need to let my hair down a little bit and have some fun. And I was felt a little boxed in. So it's, it's very, it, it was hard for me to kind of talk about that. So that almost was a deal breaker. That part of the book was almost a deal breaker to actually write the book and to be a willing participant in the story. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> She started that with, I'm going to let John talk about it. That's fine. And I was like, wait, I just want to say that this is here. I agree with you. Yeah. It was yeah. hard. What uh, she said. That's fine. Do you need do you want another glass of wine before we transition to the next note? <laughs> no, no, no. We're good. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's talk about food. Okay. So, um, Mishama, you said before you arrived at the Gray, had you, you hadn't written a menu before. Is that that's right? Okay. So you're obviously you were obviously a quite an experienced chef. You knew food. That's what you did every day. What's the difference between you know the the cooking and the deep understanding of the food and transitioning to a place where you are, I guess, almost telling a story to your guests, setting out the journey, mapping it. I mean, what are you, what was, okay. Yeah, go. That's the difference. Okay. Um, you gotta give a place for people to go. You have to kind of like bring them in. You need to cook food that's a, that's interesting. And also that wants them, has them coming back. And I didn't know how to do that. I just knew how to cook like a piece of fish well or chicken well. And this is the sauce that, someone liked and um because they grew up in italy and they had this kind of experience from their grandmother and this is the sauce that i was cooking i was always kind of told what was my daily prep list and so to create that vision for myself the diner and the cooks i never had experience doing that so it took a little while to kind of find the inspiration in that um, and find the, like sort of like the North Star in order to do that. So it was it was it was challenging because I my first menu was like all over the place. It was all over. The place. It sounded good, but it didn't make any sense. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think you said something really important, which is I think it's beyond the menu. I think restaurants are, should be storytellers and the good ones are, you know, and it can be a Michelin three star Guy Savoy or 11 Madison Park and they're telling their story or it could be the taco joint, you know, around the corner. No, seriously, like yeah. because those those the great taco joints are telling you a story of their heritage and, you know, how they got to America. And, you know, why they're cooking the food of their home. And 
I think that the gray, we always try to be a holistic experience and tell our personal stories and tell the story of the bus terminal and in a way embrace the, the sort of the dark past of the South and the hopeful future of a dynamic South. And we try and embody all of those things in, in, in every guest experience. Now we don't, we fall short a lot, you know, uh, but that's our goal. So Mishama, when you arrived in Savannah, you'd been, you know, you'd been in New York City and obviously you'd been used to a certain way of doing things and purveyors and assumedly different sources and farmers you worked with and all of that. Um, what did you find when you landed in Savannah and, you know, what, what was new to you? I mean, also you should, we should, we should know you spent part of your childhood in Savannah. So when I say new, you weren't dropped into some totally, you know, foreign location. No, it felt comfortable because I was a child there, but as an adult, you don't have any resources. Uh -huh. um, I didn't work a day in Savannah until the gray open. Well, before the gray open, I worked, but until the gray open, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't have any other experience. And one of the things, it's a little bit of a spoiler alert, but like one of the things was that we kept what we were doing very low key. So there were, we weren't, other than looking for people to work with us within the restaurant, we weren't casting out this net within the community to sort of expose what our intentions were. People just knew I was a partner in this project, but they didn't really know it was a restaurant. They weren't quite sure what it was. So if you, are familiar with restaurants, networking is all of it. Like you call up your chef friend and you say, oh my God, that pork I had at your restaurant was amazing. Who did you buy it from? Okay, and then all of a sudden everybody's buying from the same farmer. And that wasn't happening in Savannah for me. I was just kind of like in this limbo stage of trying to figure it out. So it was harder, it was, it was hard. It was hard to figure out like who to buy things from. So I met this woman named Cynthia Hayes and she, um, introduced me to this whole new network of farmers and purveyors and people. And she made it easy for me to kind of like seek out the things that I wanted to buy and the people that I wanted to work with. And once I found her, it became um, more tangible of the food that I wanted to cook because it wasn't that, it wasn't, it was, all of it was so abstract until then and it took a while and i think it's true like the process is the process and i've never been in that position before where i needed to create something and i didn't know if i could i i signed up for it like i could but i wasn't sure and i didn't know what i needed to do i didn't know what my process was because i never did it and now i understand what my process is it's like okay i need two weeks or three weeks or whatever in order to kind of figure out how I'm going to build this plan or what the foundation is to lay it out. Because this was a first for both of us. So I didn't know how to build a plan and communicate it. And he didn't know how to build a plan. I don't know if he knew how to build a plan and communicate it, but well, I just didn't know. I knew, I knew enough about Savannah at that point that ice machine. I knew enough about Savannah at that point that I knew that if people caught wind of what we were doing, like in the local newspaper, that they would have set expectations for us that we could not have met when we opened the gray. And so- What was that saying used to say? I don't remember. Information was currency. Oh yeah, information is currency in, in Savannah. That's actually my wife saying, but it's really true. And so, I wanted, and I think it was a really, in retrospect, a really good move that we did it this way, even though it created a lot of challenges for us. I wanted to open the door and people walked in and that was their first impression. Not, there was a rumor mill of impression or speculation happening beforehand because I think it would have lessened our chances of being successful. And that was just the business guy in me going like, you know what? sort of the way the book opens, right? It's a cold open, right? It's like punch them in the mouth. And I didn't want to weaken that punch in the mouth when they walked into the space and saw this really, what I think is well-designed space and knew 
her food was going to knock people's socks off. And I just wanted that to be the cold open for the restaurant. Yeah, and I think as we become um, more and more familiar with each other, like we both need different things in order to do what we do very well. And I think um, I needed something completely different during that time, but I didn't know enough um, to say that. I was kind of like, okay, cool. Let's figure out what these resources are that I do have access to and let's work within that. But now that we're six years in, I totally know like this is how he needs to process things and how he needs to work. And I know that this, I need to work a completely different way. So I'm curious about that, you know, the, this idea that you information is currency. I think that's probably not only Savannah, but I'd, I'd love to hear more about yeah, it's general. I mean, you both got a little sly smile on your face when that, yeah. <laughs> when that came out. Um, so the, the food is starting to coalesce in the sense that Mashami, you're making the connections and all that. But you also have, which I think, Jono, you were alluding to, this really incredible container, um, this space um, that, you know, I'm sure people had a lot of thoughts about. Um, it's also, if I understand this correctly, having not been there, situated sort of right on the edge of, um, you know, two really different worlds in terms of race and class and, um, you know, worlds that don't always intersect um, naturally in Savannah. And again, this is not a Savannah specific, you know, New York City, we've got the Italian American neighborhoods and the Chinese American neighborhoods and the African American neighborhoods. So anyway, um, what, what steps did you take to try to make it a place and a space where, and maybe you didn't, I guess this is my, I guess I'm projecting a little bit, but a space where both those worlds would feel welcome, where, where, where people would feel welcome to come in and they, um, whether or not they had preconceived notions coming in. <laughs> Um, we have ice going on. <laughs> do it, do it, do it. Get your ice. Get your damn ice. Guys, this is the best part of virtual events. It's the reality show part. It's like camera goes out. It's someone in the background you don't expect. Yes, people, we are behind the scenes at New York City hottest concept restaurant right now, which has just reopened, intersects by Lexus. Can talk about you know, he didn't know how much ice we needed tonight, so he has to get more. That's a good sign. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good sign when they have to restock the ice bin. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are um, you're blowing it out of the water tonight. <laughs> see you later. Um, so I think that we, we, we always we always talked about building the gray as a local restaurant. And I think that was the first thing we did was to think about us as being a Savannah restaurant and not because most of the restaurants in Savannah were, they were tourist based. Most downtown, downtown, yeah, most downtown restaurants. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. In the historic district. Yeah. And so we wanted to be a downtown restaurant that the locals were our primary constituency. And I think I naively thought that when I wanted to partner with somebody who was the opposite of me, a, a woman and a woman of color being a white guy, um, that we would naturally attract um, all of Savannah, you know, the white community, the black community. And that didn't really happen for us, but that was sort of, that was kind of baked into what we thought we were doing. Um, and it took, it took a few years for us to achieve even some sense of um, evenness in who our guests are now. Yeah, there's not a lot of um, diversity in the historical downtown community. There's diversity in the, well, Black folks live bordering the community. They don't have a crazy, they don't have that disposable income for a place like the gray, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was a little bit of um, a shocker that when we opened, we were 50-50. I think it was a reality check. 
And the yeah. reality was that like the people who knew about us had that disposable income and had the resources to come and dine there. And the people who lived right behind us didn't have that, you know? And they may have known about us when we were out of their league. So there was like this little Mexican spot that was two doors down for us, from us. And that's where everybody went. Why? Because they could afford to go there. They can take their family out for dinner and it's like 30, 40 bucks, you know? Yeah. We to do other things though too, like, you know, so we have this bar in the front that was the original lunch counter that serviced the, um, the bus terminal. And we created a different menu in that space and we kept that price point much, much lower and made it much more accessible, you know, and we, but it was a wine program, you know, and a cocktail program. Yeah, I think it was intimidating at first to people who were not restaurant rats, you know? Um, and we did things out in the yard, you know, where the buses used to pull in. Mishama was telling this story earlier today where we were doing, on Saturdays, we do $7 plates of food. But the restaurant intimidated people. So we thought if we said, and, and it worked, I mean, to a certain degree, it does work, right? We get scat kids in the diner bar because it's cheaper for them to eat there. Um, you know, we do events out in the yard that are usually charity-based now. We get good turnouts for things like that. And so this is all goes back to that idea of, of building trust in the community and them knowing that you're going to be there for them, not just to make a buck or whatever, whatever floats your boat, but that you're part of the community. And that's why I said originally, like, we always wanted to be a Savannah restaurant before anything. Yeah, thank you. All right, I'm going to do some rapid fire questions that may or may not have anything to do with the book. And I'm also going to remind folks that um, we will take a few questions right at the end. So at the bottom of your screen where it says ask a question, if you want to pop one in there, um, I'll get to them in a bit. Okay, Mashama, starting with you. Favorite dish to eat that someone else is cooking? Like you go out, what, what do you want? Oh. Um, <laughs> favorite dish to eat that someone else is cooking? Rapid fire. Something with crab or fish and grits. Jono. Um, Michelle is pasta carbonara. <laughs> uh, Michelle is country pasta, but it's pasta carbonara. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Michelle, someone's a guest in your home. What do you serve them? Roasted chicken, vegetables, a nice salad, some a bottle of white wine. Jono, someone comes. I'm coming over for dinner. What are you? What are you cooking? Pasta carbonara. No, no, I make it. I would make, I would make some kind of pasta, and I would do like a chicken cutlet, fried chicken cutlet kicker. All right, uh, I'm in a bookstore. I got to ask this question, and I'm conscious that. If either of you say you've read a book in the past year, it'll be a miracle given everything you've got going on. So it can be a current favorite book or an author that's your favorite or a book in the past. Best book on your shelf, Mashama. Uh, the best book on my shelf I haven't read yet. And it's called Southern Provisions by David Shields. And I need, I like, it's, it's like an encyclopedia, but I feel like I need to read it I need it. He's a walking talk. It's like He's amazing. Right I need to read that book. And every time I pick it up, I fall asleep. But um, that's because I'm a really slow reader. <laughs> and I'm tired. And I'm tired all the time. <laughs> Jana, what's. I actually am almost through with the book. And I haven't read a lot of books since we opened The Gray. And I used to be an avid reader. Um, but I am almost done with When Harry Met Minnie, which is Martha Teichner's um, yeah. memoir about her dogs. Um, cool. And it's really great. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm glad to have that recommendation. We've got that here and um, I've been eyeing it. Yeah, you should read it. It's fun. All right. It's also sad and gut wrenching, but fun. I, yeah, my brother had a couple pit bulls, so it's a very, uh, yeah. yeah. All right. As soon as it's safe to travel in the world again, first place you're going, Mashama. Uh, Mexico. Mexico Donna. City. Paris. Mexico. I, 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 I'm obsessed with Paris. 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 For those of you, again, if you don't have your copy of the book, get the book. 
they edited this book together in her apartment. Was it six weeks? Six weeks you spent? And you read every weeks. single word twice? Is that my understanding? That's true. Yeah. I mean, in it's a flat um, in the seventh r and mode of Paris, yeah. Yeah. Because we combined it as a food eating trip. That's how he does it. It's true, we ate a lot of food. And it's not, not true, but you love to add that part to people. That just sounds so pretentious. We were right in Paris. It. <laughs> it's like I'm a total Hemingway freak as well. So, you know, no anything French or Spanish is good with me. Hemingway, there's a PBS doc coming out April 5th. Tape it. It's supposed to be amazing. Yeah. Oh, um, okay, Mishama, how do you define success? Short, short. <sighs> happy a little bit of joy some money in the bank yeah i think you know i think it is successful if you can sleep at night and not have too many worries jano i don't know if i figured it out yet that's fair yeah um all right before i move on to questions from the audience which i'm going to do in a moment um I do want to note, you guys aren't slowing down. So you're doing this Intersect um, concept in New York right now, which I'm noting one of our event partners, Layla Jenkins, who is the owner of Lorca Coffee Bar in Stanford, said she just booked a reservation. So oh, look great. for Layla when cool. she comes in. Layla, text me when you're going, and I'll let them know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Let us know. Yeah. So you're doing that. And um, you're also opening a new space in Austin, yes? Two spaces in Austin. Where okay. we have a we have a place in Savannah called the Gray Market, which is like a diner, lunch counter kind of space, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we're opening one of those in Austin, and then that space I was talking about earlier, that's in the front, the, the old lunch counter part of the Gray. We call that the diner bar. So we're taking that and we're expanding it into a full service restaurant um, in the in the ground floor of the new Thompson Hotel that's being built on Fifth and Brazos in downtown Austin for anybody who's familiar with Austin. So, and Mishama, can you, you can't do Port City food in Austin, can you? Are you excited? Are you thinking about new types? I mean, will the food be similar? Will it have a different flavor to it? It will definitely be similar. And I think it will have a different flavor to it. I think that part of the joy of cooking that we're doing in the savannah is that it's very specific to the region. And I want to keep that because I want to keep that idea and that thought process because I think it's going to grow the repertoire of what the grade does overall, you know, as a, as a company. So I think it's important. We just, um, I'll give you an example. I think that, so Mishama and our CDC at the Gray Market did a breakfast burrito this week at the Gray Market in Savannah. And we were talking about it. It's like, that kind of sounds like we should call that the Austin, right? Because it's got that sort of Tex-Mex flavor to it. And so I think that's how you'll see the crossover work. Like we have a sandwich at the Gray Market in, um, in Savannah right now that we call the NYC, which is bacon, egg, and cheese on a Kaiser roll, right? Is there a more neater oh, yeah. thing than that? Yeah. No, no. Love a Kaiser roll. Yeah. Yeah. Love a Kaiser roll. Um, the, the chat is exploding here. Okay, people want to know, when is, when is Austin opening? Is that public? information yeah they're hoping so we're at the we're sort of at the mercy of the um the hotel and right now they think around somewhere sometime in august okay yeah. cool uh david genovese who is the um brilliant uh lead behind the corbin district which is where our bookstore is says he he would like to give you his number because he wants you to open a gray market in darien so in case you ever there. decide <laughs> to expand to New England, I will I will make a connection. Um, okay, Chef Caitlin McGowan, who also says she also just booked a reservation at the Intersect. You're going to be full up of um, Darien people. I just saw you have a question, Caitlin. Yes. So, best advice for female chefs? Say it. <laughs> Say what you want. Say what you need. Um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to get what you got to get out of it. You know, don't be intimidated by the hierarchy. <laughs> I think I've said it pre-served today here at, at the Intersect um, pop-up. And the GM here has said to the servers, like, be bold. Yeah. It's like, be bold. I think women have a tendency to sh shrink. And I think um, we just kind of do it because 
we're trying to prove something. We're trying to prove that we're just as strong as the guys. And I think that um, the reason why they uh, band together is because they communicate in this way that they support each other. And I think we got to kind of bust our way in there and not make any apologies and not use our sex as a, as a, a soft point. You know, we're just as important and strong and crucial in this environment as anyone else. So just say what you want. Listen, if you got to, you know, I was about to get vulgar, and not vulgar, if you got your period and you need to go like buy some tampons, like let's say, listen, <laughs> I need five, I need 10 minutes, chef, I'll be right back. <laughs> I, I will add something not on the period front, but um, you know, I think in this in this current environment, like there's two schools of thought, and one is find allies, and the other one is not, is to sort of push people who don't look like you away. Mm -hmm. I would say find allies, like we, and I'm not I'm not saying I I think I am though. Like we exist, yeah, we exist, and and find them and seek them out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Chef Caitlin also wants to know favorite Italian food. Please, John O. My favorite Italian food of all time, like all where time. I eat it. No, I know. I think she uh, might. My, gra my grandmother's Sunday gravy. The recipe's in the book. It's like. It's in the book. It's, it's in, in the, book, the book, people, which can be purchased yeah. right here. Uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, favorite restaurant that isn't the gray. Ooh, that's tough. All right. Not for me. That's something you can answer. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, hmm, in New York, I would say Prune. I'm sorry. I wish I can't wait for it to reopen. I know. Um, another restaurant, uh, Uncle Boone's Thai restaurant. It's noisy. It's loud. Oh, sure. Um, but they have a window. They have a, it's called Thai Cafe or something like that. And they have like a window that they have open, but um, El Buco is good. Like on that whole little stretch is where I kind of like fell in love with like that elevated kind of like, you know, indigenous kind of food. I like, I like the Lower East Side. I like that part. For me, if you're in New York City, Go to Bellato's on Houston Street between Mott and Mulberry. It's one of the last of the old school Little Italy Italians. Mm. Um, and that, I obsess with that restaurant. And then my favorite, I think my favorite restaurant of all time is a place in Paris um, called Chez Denise, which they have a dish called Aricot de Mouton, which is mutton and white beans. And it's, I've been chasing it for 30 years from the first time I ever ate it. And every time we go to Paris or my wife and I go, it's like three stops at Chez Denise. I just, I just want to make a note, Mashama, of your facial expressions, which are so gratifying to me because when I was reading this book, sometimes when you're reading it, you're kind of like, I think Mashama is just standing there and she's shaking her head and it's like- so bougie. Like he's trying to act like he's not. Everybody's allowed to so own their bougie. stuff, but I can't own my stuff. I like a restaurant in Paris. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> You can hold it, but people can talk about it. Too. All right. Um, let's see. Favorite drink after a long day. Ooh, that's a good one. You're going to need that tonight, Mashama. Double Negroni. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Six ounces of booze. I'm also on the Negroni train. Yeah. It's one of the things that kind of bonded us. It's our favorite cocktail. It's Gabrielle Hamilton's favorite cocktail. It's like, really introduced, like working at Prune sort of rounded the whole picture out for me. It really introduced me to front of house and cocktails and wine. Like it was part of like, it completed the conversation for me. So uh, uh, double, uh, I'm like a double, they used to call me double Negroni at Prune. I don't do double Negronis anymore, but I do like a Negroni. No, I haven't done a double Negroni in a long time. It just works two in a row. <laughs> Yeah, that's all good. My husband's a Negroni guy too, so you guys can all. Uh, that's the. It's like the best cocktail. It's so balanced. Too. He would agree with you. He would agree. Um. All right. And favorite recipe and the story behind it. And I think you both can answer it. Although, Misham, I'm gonna let you whack at that first. So in the book, you mean? No, I think I think they're saying of all. Uh, well, if you want I'm to talk about the book. The book. Yeah, do the book. Because we're here to talk about the book. So yeah, my favorite recipe 
then the book I think is Dirty Rice because it comes after this really kind of like, um, there's a few uncomfortable chapters, but there's this chapter was is full of like poor decisions, I think. Um, and so I love the fact that it's kind of like, mm, sometimes you gotta get a little dirty to kind of get where you need to go. So you don't mean to be mad, there's no malice behind it, but you kind of have to step on a couple of toes. So I like Dirty Rice, yeah. Um. Just, I see a question. Our Negroni recipe at the gray is just, um, it's one and a half gin, one, one, Ari and the hood. So, um, my favorite recipe, I just, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I just, I always go to pasta when I'm cooking at home for Carol and me. So, but all kinds of pastas, like, and what you can do, like, my favorite recipe is when you have nothing in the house and you can figure out how to make pasta taste good, you know? So like olive oil and dried up garlic because it's been sitting on the counter for too long and wilted parsley that's been in the fridge too long, you know, like stuff like that, you know? Love it. Yeah. But you yeah. said you- Nick, said as you a reminder, you are trying to sell the book. No, Mashana's right. She's trying to sell a book. Ladies and gentlemen, um, these two beautiful people have to go back out on the floor. <laughs> and work at 9 p.m. at night because that's their world. I cannot thank you enough for spending this hour with us. I know you snuck us in during a very busy time and I am incredibly grateful and I know all the people here are so grateful. People, buy the book. You can do it on our website. We'll get it to you. We'll bring it to your house. Thank you so much. Loved being with you both. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hey, thank you. This is great. And the questions were great. And Thank you, everybody who came out. Thank you so much. And I looked at the bookstore. There's 81 years strong. Congratulations. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful night. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.